Hello. Today we begin our examination of regional economic imperatives. Now the shoe is on the other foot, however, uh, because I'm on this side of the couch. And I welcome Rebecca Teo. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca is a lecturer in journalism at the University of Southern Queensland, and she will be interviewing me. So thanks for that, and I'll leave the interview in your capable hands. Thank you very much, Anna. We'll see who survives. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So take us through what you mean in the first instance by regional economic imperatives. OK, well, this is a phrase that means a lot of things, but put simply, what I'm referring to here is what economic developments or advancements are important in the Asia, uh, Asian region. Mm -hmm. But this really isn't an easy question to answer. And if we think about Asia and what we've already been looking about in terms of the Asia-Pacific region is this is not a homogenous grouping. There are a number of different states or countries, you might know them as, different states within the region with different peoples, different cultures, different religions, different political systems and also different economic structures. So what we mean by regional economic imperatives is very much going to come down to really, I think, uh, the regional, uh, the state uh, economic aspirations or the developments that individual states want their economies to um, undergo. If we think about the four Asian dragons or the, um, uh, the Asian dragons or four Asian tigers as they're sometimes referred to, these are the most economically advanced states within the Asia, Asian region. Well, um, if we think about what they would want from economic uh, development or their economic aspirations, what their economic imperatives are, well, that's a very different thing to say what the economic imperatives of Bangladesh or Myanmar are. Now, the four Asian tigers are um, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea and Taiwan. And what they would really be looking at is a continuation of their economic development, which has been achieved through neoliberal policies, um, including things like very uh, aggressive trade with the industrialised countries of the, um, the global north. They would want a continuation of that. They would also want their own particular state governments to continue to um, intervene in instances where they may need some assistance within their economic uh, system. So this could be things like their governments actually subsidising uh, industries that aren't really making uh, a profit or who are struggling. And we've seen that in other states, particularly uh, when you think about subsidies to support things like the motor vehicle industry. Now, other states, however, like Bangladesh, for instance, their, um, I mean, their imperatives would largely be impacted on the fact that they are a developing country. So they haven't um, yet reached that developed nation state status. So if we think about Bangladesh, well, for a long time, um, from really from the Second World War and, and before then, their economic structure was based on the production of jute and selling jute. Now, jute is a very tough fibre that was largely used for um, rope, other kinds of things like that. Now, around the 1940s, jute comprised of 80% of their exports. And by the 1970s, we still saw that jute was an important product, uh, export product for them, and it accounted for about 70% of their exports. But then we see the introduction of um, propyl, um, polypropylene, mm -hmm. hard word to say, yes. <laughs> uh, and we start to see the jute industry decline. And for Bangladesh, jute as an export commodity then fell away and so they really had a significant problem there because their competitive economic advantage had been structured around this product, jute. Since then we've seen Bangladesh try to become less dependent on foreign grants and foreign loans. It's tried to diversify its economy and it's really tried to seek out a, um, a different ec a competitive economic advantage so that it's uh, economic strength can increase. And we've seen it do that by transforming itself to become really significant when it comes to the world um, garment industry. Mm -hmm. So because of cheap labour costs and other related factors, Bangladesh is now one of the world's leaders in export 
um, clothing. So they manufacture the clothing and export it. And three quarters of their economy is actually geared towards garment production. And they are now, in fact, the world's third largest clothes export industry. Right. Now, in addition to that, they've also uh, tried to transform um, and diversify their economy by looking at other areas that they can also um, you know, make money from. And one of those is tourism. So they're really trying to diversify their their economic advantage and their competitive economic advantage because of that experience that they had um, with the jute industry. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, different economic <coughs> states have different economic uh, imperatives because of their specific economic circumstances. Yes, that's true. Right. Okay. So are there economic imperatives in common to the region as a whole? Well, I mean, this is a difficult one to answer, and I, I guess when you get beyond those individual states and what their particular economic imperatives are, there are imperatives that are unique to the region as a whole. Now, in terms of the 21st century, it's often been described as the Asian century. It has been predicted that the Asian nations will actually become the world's leaders. And I guess the way that they're going to do this is largely through uh, their economic strength. So there would be that imperative within the region for economic growth in all the states within the region. Now, remembering the 19th century was called the British century, the 20th century was called the American century. Uh, in terms of the Asian century, well, I think that's really going to have a big impact uh, around the world, probably more on examination of what's happened before. So uh, there's been a lot of inequality around the world. Uh, there have been really serious problems caused by things like colonisation, and we've looked at that already in this course. So I think one of the things the Asian century will bring about is more of a realistic reset within the world as to how world affairs um, should be managed, um, how things in the world should occur, whether that leads to any changes, though I'm, I'm highly sceptical of that. But there are critics uh, who argue that this uh, Asian century won't actually occur. And, and these critics are largely focused on the fact that economic growth really needs a strong, um, cohesive and um, supportive political structure. It needs stability uh, and it needs healthy trade practices. Um, and these are things that we haven't yet fully seen across the whole region. So there are some factors there that may mean that this doesn't happen. Uh, however, I think if, in terms of a regional economic imperative, there's a lot of drive in the region that, you know, this really could be our time to shine. So there is that um, notion throughout many countries and they're, they're aiming to see how far that they can go with this um, e economic um, industrial might. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Anna. It sounds like your students have got um, enough information to, to approach this from a number of different directions. Thank you. No, that's, that's true. And I hope they really do um, enjoy this particular module. And I look forward to interviewing you in a couple of weeks when, of we, look at, <laughs> when we look at the media as a form of soft power. Okay. So thank you. No worries.